You touched on it a few times, but that's fine. Because now it sometimes just go right along with it. I love it when the Lord works things out like that. All right, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. When you get there, turn up and look up here and smile so I know you're there. All right. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And we want to welcome our guests this morning, too. Amen. So, amen. amen. Welcome to Heritage Baptist Church. All right, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. Father, we thank you for the day, and I pray, God, you'd open our eyes and our ears and our minds so that we can see, hear, and understand what you have for us this morning. But most of all, God, open our hearts so we can receive it and use it in our lives. Be with those that are yet on the way, get them here safe. Those that are sick or wounded, I pray, God, you raise them back up. Bring them back to us, for we miss it. We thank you for those that are here today that have been ill, have had those struggles and challenges. We thank you that you strengthen them enough to get them here today. We pray now you strengthen them more, not only in the body, but also in the soul and in the mind with what you have for us today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Anybody remember that series, The Thief in the Night? Yeah. Yeah. Put out, I don't know, back to probably back in the 80s. 1980. Yeah, in the 80s. And they were quite the movie in their day. Today, they look kind of dated. You know, bell, <laughs> bell bottom trousers and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But they were good movies. And they were pretty scary. <laughs> they, were, they were pretty close. Um, I remember because that was one of the first movies, I, the first Christian movie I saw was actually at the Seventh day Adventist church. What they would do, even in the small town I lived in, Carnation, which at that time I think had, I think we'd grown from 150 to about 200 people at that time. And a little Seventh-day Adventist church, the whole building was probably not as big as this auditorium, but they would rent a big 35 millimeter projector. Mm -hmm. Okay, And they would show movies, and that's how they would get people to come in, and they showed the Ten Commandments. Oh, oh yeah. Charlton Heston. One of the epitome of the Jews, six foot three, white dude. You know. <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, we didn't know. And it's a wonderful movie, don't get me wrong. But there is another movie called Moses with Ben Kingsley. And Ben Kingsley's about five foot six. Yeah. And he's got the Jewish nose. I mean, that, that he looked more like Moses than Charlton Heston did. But I'll never forget the Ten Commandments. I watch it about once a year over a three day period. I'll watch about half an hour, 45 minutes, and then I'll start to fall asleep or something. Then I'll watch some more the next night and the next night. Because I love those old movies. But The Thief in the Night, that was a good series of movies. All right? And then uh, um, it reminded me, because that phrase is in this passage of Scripture, it reminded me that, uh, you know, a lot of people today don't believe in the second coming. A lot of Christians quote, unquote, churches, teach there is no second coming. The Catholics teach that the second coming is when the Catholic Church will rule the world in the name of Christ with the Pope as the vicar of Christ. That's what they've always taught, and that's what they still teach. The, the, the Mormons, big religion here in Utah, they teach it's when the, the world goes into chaos 
and the Mormons are supposed to keep a year's worth of food and ammunition in store so that when chaos comes, they can then take those out and they'll take over the world, take over this country to start with. A lot of people have a lot of weird ideas about what the second coming means and why it says it's as a thief in the night. But uh, a lot of them don't believe in the second coming. They believe a lot of Christians, churches, are teaching things to get better and better. I don't find that at all. That after COVID, during, during COVID, when it, when it finally was pretty much quieting down, church attendance shot up. They did. It did. came up. One third of the people after COVID, one third of the regular church attenders decided they're never going to come back to live church. That they per prefer the live stream. That's why we live stream it, because at least we can get God's word to them that way. But one third of the people that used to attend church regularly said they're not going to come back to live church anymore. It's easier just to do it at home. Well, that's true in a way, but where's the fellowship? I don't know about you, but I need it. Amen. Sunday, amen. yeah, so it's going to amen because he amen. missed a bunch with his illness. Uh, illness is yeah. But I'll tell you what, Sunday to me is an encouragement. Yeah. It kind of charges my battery. Yeah. See, emotion is contagious. Amen. It is. Well, come on, we're supposed to preach the word of God and not, you know, emotions. Well, now, wait a minute, didn't God give us emotions? Yeah. Yep. We teach in the public speaking class, if there's no emotion when you give a sermon, or if you're a Sunday school teacher giving a, a lesson, if there's no emotion, then you might as well just shut up and let somebody else do it. Because if you preach God more like this, <laughs> so, <laughs> people are already gone. No, you, you got, come on. I don't find where Christ said, well, maybe I'll think about going to the cross. I don't know, though. That's probably going to hurt a bunch. So I'm not sure. No. It says before the foundation of the world. He was the lamb chosen to be slain from before the foundation of the world. Sounds to me like it was emotional. How about sweating as it were drops of blood? He didn't sweat blood. We use that same term today. Man, I sweated blood before that text. No, it's, a, it's like a metaphor, a simile. He sweat, and the Bible's very specific, as it were, great drops of blood. In other words, the sweat was running off him. And he was very emotional. Read the account in the garden. Sounds like that was probably, if not the emotion, most emotional moment in the story of Christ, at least in the top two or three. Yeah. The other one was when he looked on Jerusalem and said, you'd slain the prophets, and he went and wept. I remember Sunday school, memorize the scripture. Okay, Jesus wept. There we go, that's the scripture. And so Christ was very emotional. And so we are to be emotional. Come on. The world's already blasé. Just, uh, well, I've got to go to work. Well, I vote on Monday morning. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians say, well, we've got to go to church today because it's Sunday. No, I don't got to go to church. I get to go to church. Thank you. My favorite cartoon Amen. Is, Amen. is a guy sitting in bed with a sheet and blankets pulled right up under his chin and little streaks on the side of his head so you can see he's going like this and his wife is standing there saying but dear you have to go to church you're the pastor <laughs> you don't think the pastor is getting down the pastor not only have to carry the burden of themselves and the burden of their own family but they carry the burdens of just about everybody else in the church at one time or another they come to the pastor and you don't think it's emotional when someone comes into your office and sits down and they're weeping, I mean, just gut-wrenching weeping, that rubs off on your wife because emotional emotion is contagious. That's why kindness, we're to be kind to people, we're to be compassionate to people. That's a very emotional word, isn't it? Compassion. And so there are a lot of people that say, no, 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 things are getting better in the Christians because after COVID, when it started slowing down, uh, church attendance not only went back to normal, it actually went above normal. Well, yeah, I mean, people have been stuck at home for a couple of years. Of course they're going to want to get together. But then one-third of them decided, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stay home. But they still say that things are getting better and better in our church. They're having revivals here. They're having a revival over there. Uh, there was one that took place in Canada. It was the Barking Revival. Okay, it took place in Canada. This was 
25 years ago, and then it came to the laughing revival. Yeah. Then that became the puking revival. Have you heard of that one? Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We uh, leased a building. I was associate pastor up in Washington. We re re leased a building from uh, Foursquare Church. The old building that used to be their small chapel, uh, they rented that out, so we had our services there in the afternoon. But in the main chapel, it was a beautiful wine-colored carpet like this, but it had light bleach spots about that big around, all over. Do you know what hydrochloric acid, your stomach acid, does to florists when you puke? Yeah, yeah. And that's what they did. You can't lay down and laugh for 20 minutes without throwing up. And so then that became holy purging. And they actually had, I mean, not white, but very light spots all over the carpet because that was the revival. Started as barking, then it went to laughing, and then it started in holy purging. And then things are getting better and better. I don't find that. You know what I find? I find churches that are catering more to the world to get more people in. Yeah. That's what they're doing. You got, you, got to, you got to have the world's music. You got to dress like the largest church in the United States over in Canada. Canada. Over in California. Well, it might as well be Canada. It's like a foreign country. I'm just kidding. But over in California, the largest church in America, they come in cutoffs. Yeah, cutoffs. Sweatshirts. Not sweatshirts, too warm. T-shirts. And that's how they show up for church. And they'll have around five or 7,000 in the morning service. Then they have three or four or 5,000 in the afternoon service. They have to have two services for the people. And then I don't know what they do on Wednesday night. I don't even know if they meet. I think what they do is they have uh, breakout groups that meet different times during the week. But they're starting to look like the world. And Christians talk like the world. And they've got Bibles like the world. They've, they've got the street Bibles where Jesus and his homies. Yeah, Jesus and his homies hung out together. They had the hippie Bible. I remember that came out back in the 1990s. Yeah, it was the hippie Bible. And it had the vernacular that the hippies used. Jesus said, far out, man. Good job. I don't remember Jesus ever saying that. And it's getting worse. Today, it's not that things are getting better. It's just, just as they absorb more of the world into the churches to get more people, they think it's getting better because they're growing. You know, if I remember right, Jesus' church only had 12 people in it. Thank you. And one of them was possessed by the devil. Yep. Right. And by the time he died and ascended to heaven, there were only 120 Amen. that met in the upper room to do some church business and vote in a new replacement for Judas. And so it's not that things are getting better. It's that there's more of the world getting into the churches so they can get more people and grow and get more money to build bigger buildings. That's what this thief in the night that passage is about. We're supposed to be watching for the Lord coming back. Oh, yeah. Not just here in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Back in chapter 4, it's where to comfort one another because, you know, we're going to be raised. It's the one that we use for graveside services. You know, that, that uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And he's talking now about the thief in the night, and it's just a metaphor for the second coming of Christ. And that's all it is. He uses this because when does the thief come? In the night. In the night. In the night. You don't know how many people are robbed while they're in their bed sleeping. You can get pretty sneaky. I know. I know. Because my wife goes to bed a couple hours before I do. And uh, when I'm done with my studies, I, I know how to shut a door without making a sound. You don't just shut the door. Turn the knob, put your finger up, and when the door touches your finger, then you just slowly let it come until it rests. And then you slowly let, and it doesn't make any noise. Right? I don't flush the toilet at night, because it'll wake up my wife. Well, you know, thieves can, are sneakier than I am. They can come into your house and rob you while you're in there and sleep. And so that's why you use a thief in the night as a phrase, as, as a metaphor for the second coming of Christ. Verses 1 and 2. But of the times in the season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. He said, Church of Thessalonica, 
He says, you know all these things. The things that that's talked about in, in what we call chapter 4, but it, for Paul it would have been the earlier part of the letter. He says, he says, you already know these things. So now he's just going to kind of remind them a little bit. Brethren of the times and the seasons, brethren, but of the times and the season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. When you're not expecting it. In the darkness. When everybody's asleep. And they're not on the lookout. And we're going to find why he uses a thief in the night. And talking about people that are asleep or people that are drunken. We're going to find out what he's referring to there. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the light, in the night. And then verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 13. And you find out where this whole idea came from. Isaiah chapter 13. And... Uh, Let's read verses 6 through 9. Isaiah 13, verse 6. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. He said, you better start not only just weeping, you better have gut-wrenching sobs and start wailing, howling, like you're at a funeral. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come and boy, wait a minute. The day of the Lord was at hand at the time of Isaiah. On the time clock of history, we're not in the last hours. We're not in the last minutes. We must be in the last seconds. Because he's saying, it, you better be looking for it back then, because the day of the Lord shall come. Verse 6, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. She's given birth. Uh, th those of you ladies that gave birth felt real good, didn't it? <laughs> no, it didn't. I've had women tell me they've never felt a pain that bad in their life. But the Bible says then later when they see the baby, they just kind of forget about it. Which is a good thing or there'd never be a second child. <laughs> They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Hey, we're talking about a horrible time. When the day of the Lord shall come, the second coming of the Lord, it's not going to be a Hey, here it comes. It is for us. But it's not going to be for the rest of the world. And so he said, as a woman in travail, they shall say, peace and safety. They're not going to be looking for it. And he's not talking here just about lost people. He's talking about Christians that, spiritually speaking, are asleep. Hey, things are getting better. We don't have, we can live any way we want to. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I'm saved anyway, so I know I'm going to go to heaven. Well, now, wait a minute. There's going to be a judgment for the, for the oh. saints. Oh, yes. Our works are going to be judged. We're already judged in Christ. We can't go to hell. But I'll tell you what. We can sure lose every reward we ever thought we might be getting from God because of the way we live. So he's not just talking about lost people here. He's talking about Christians that aren't looking for the second coming. They're just it's like they're asleep. They're, they're, they're not ready. They're, there's, there's no escape. Whether they're saved or lost, it's going to happen. Ladies, when, when your travail, your birth pangs came upon you, did you say, oh no, that would hurt. I'm not going through with this. <laughs> Forget it. No, no, I refuse. I'm, I'm not going to go. It, it, it hurt too much. Oh, that second one. Oh, now I want out of here. <laughs> you know, when it starts, it's going to take place. Whether you want it to or not. Amen. Be like stepping out on the highway in front of a, a truck. Whether you want to get killed or not, you're going to get splattered. Whether you want it or not. And that woman that's giving birth, there's no way to escape. And it's a pain like no other. 
Us guys can't even imagine what it's like. I can imagine what a cesarean is like because I had one. You know, when I had colon cancer, they did a six-inch cut, and I gave birth to a six-inch cancerous colon. All right? And the doctor told me, I, that's the same thing I do for a woman for a cesarean. Because they're in exactly the same spot. So I know what that's like. But that's nothing compared to regular birth. They, they give you saddle blocks. They, they give you these and this, this kind of stuff and everything. And then there are those that want to go through natural childbirth. Well, oh, amen. But about 99% of the women I know say, ain't no way. It's not going to happen. Give me some drugs. Take away this pain. Why? Because it's horrible. And it's going to happen whether you want it to or not. It's going to go to its conclusion. It's not going to stop until the whole thing's over. That's why he used that phrase. The second coming of the Lord for the lost and for those Christians that are asleep in the Lord and not looking for his coming and it's going to take them by surprise. Because you know the woman does not decide when she's going to give birth. No, the woman doesn't decide that. Now the doctors can give them a shot. I, I, I know there's a Bonnie, my wife that's in heaven now, they had to give her a shot because it got to the point to where it, it was not progressing like it should. It was going to hang on and on and on. But naturally, the woman does not, and that's just to have it come to a conclusion and just really get going. But when labor starts, it's not the woman that decides when the labor's going to start. The baby gives forth the chemical that starts the whole process. And when the second coming of the Lord happens, it's going to be the Lord that decides. Amen. Well, now, wait a minute. My Bible says not even Jesus nor the angels in heaven know when that day is going to come. Nope. But only the Father. Amen. So God is the one that's going to initiate. Amen. And once it's started, there's nothing the saved or the lost can do about it. It's going to take place. Mm -hmm. In the previous chapter, he was telling us that, hey, we're going to be raised. We're going to be gone. Okay? I said, we're going to be out of here. But look at the tribulation that's going to come upon the earth. And so once it started, they're not looking for it. They can't decide when it's going to happen. That's why we're supposed to always be looking for the coming. We're always to be looking for it. Because once it happens, it's too late for us to change anything. It's going to take us by surprise too. But a good surprise, not a bad surprise. If we're looking with joy, in fact, he, in, later on in verse uh, 16, he says, rejoice evermore. And in context, he's talking about, hey, these things that are going on, we're to encourage one another, we're to be looking for the Lord to be coming, it's going to happen, and let it be a joyous thing. Amen. Not a thing of, oh, no. Yeah. What was I doing? <laughs> the Lord's coming back. And I got a bottle of, bo bottle of Bud Dumber in my hand. It's not Budweiser, it's Bud Dumber. Oh no! That's not a good thing. I'm too. <laughs> Breath mints. Spray some of that smoke out of my mouth. Why? Because the Lord's coming, and I don't want to smell like I've been in hell. I want to smell like I haven't been in hell, because that's what you smell like with the smoke smell. And I don't care what you do, you can't get rid of it. It's in your clothes, it's in your hair, it's in your skin. My dad was one of those that he had this. I remember, uh, my childhood memories of me, I always had that cigarette butt hanging out with the ashes hanging down. He was a chain smoker, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And yellow fingers. Yeah. Oh, the Lord's coming. Oh, wait a minute. I gotta get rid of the yellow finger, and there's nothing you can do about that, those yellow fingers. They're gonna be there. We're, we're gonna be happy when the Lord comes. Amen. Yeah, it's a surprise. Hey, why? Because it's gonna surprise everybody. But it should be a joyous surprise, not a, oh, what do I hide? You know, buddy, I gotta get rid of this. I got, I got a phony but I better get rid of better get rid of my NIV or whatever it is and, and get one here that tells me about these things. That's why in my doctoral thesis, the doctrinal chaos of the translations, one of the things I used in there is yes, you could get saved out of any of the Bibles. You could. I can take any Bible they got out there and find certain scriptures and lead someone to the Lord, but I'd rather do it out of, out of a whole plate full of food. Yeah. Instead of just having to Amen. dig through the trash to find maybe a little morsel that's left down at the bottom. Amen. But in my doctoral thesis, I use this phrase. You can only be as perfect as the Bible you use. Amen. And that word perfect in the Bible generally means thoroughly equipped or mature. You can't grow in the Lord unless you've got all of the food 
Thank you. This is the food. You can't grow properly without having all of the food. Amen. And so those that, that say, listen, I'll, I'll get, when he's coming back, I'm having too much fun. I've heard this one before. I'm having too much fun right now. I'll get saved a little later. Well, what if the Lord comes back? Well, I'll make sure and do it before he comes back. You don't know when he's coming back. He's going to come off like a woman in travail. And once it starts, it's too late to do anything else. Whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. And it's going to be from beginning to end. It's not going to stop until it's complete. Like a woman in travail, it's not over until she gives birth. And then it's really not over for a few weeks after that. Because it takes a while to get over the residual pains and things like that. Your body gets back semi-normal. I don't know that it ever goes back. But hey, they, they shall say peace and safety. Things are getting better. And that's what they said. Peace and safety. For when, verse 3, for, uh, back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 3, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction. Not just sudden pain. Not, not just sudden discomfort. I've had women tell me I thought I was going to die. Yeah. I know women that went through two days of labor. I know one woman that went through almost three days of labor. Now they can give you a shot, like I said, to, you know, kind of get things going, or they can do a cesarean. But the problem is, once the birth starts, you can't do a cesarean. It has to be done before the child is in the birth canal. Because by then it's too late. All right? And so he's not talking about sudden discomfort or a little bit of embarrassment. He says, then sudden destruction come upon, cometh upon them and prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. There's no way to get out of it. Once the second coming starts, it's going to go through to its conclusion. Hopefully it will be a pleasant surprise yes, sir. and not one of destruction. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. We're not in darkness. Overtake you as a thief. See, if we're really looking for the Lord to come back, and we're living the way we should, waiting for him to come back, we're not going to be overtaken like, oh no, the thief stole everything I had. Well, see, if I'm not living, or you're not living the way the Lord wants us to when the second coming uh, happens, then all of the rewards that we could have had because of previous service to the Lord, it's going to be taken away. It's going to be gone. Uh, anybody in here ever had a thief come and knock on your door? Hey, I want to apologize. I stole your TV. Here it is. Anybody ever had that happen? I, I, there were two guys when I was in, living in Minnesota that were in the apartment I had. Railroad tracks was only less than a block away. And there were two guys... And uh, they asked if I had any food, so I took them up to my room. I, I cooked them up some potatoes and, and some canned peas and some other things, veggies and stuff, fed them. And they said, well, the train's not coming through for about another four hours. Uh, they were going to go down and hide under the bridge. That's, that's where all of the homeless that rode the rails, that's where they hid. And I said, oh, no, that's, I said, hey, why don't you stay here? I said, I've got a job interview. Uh, I'm going to go to the, on the interview. Why don't you guys stay here uh, for a while? And then you can go when the train's coming. And, and they said, thank you very much. And while I was gone, they stole my stereo. Oh. And when they went to wait for the train, uh, they took my stereo with them. So I called the cops. And the cops came. And I said, and the cops said, they're probably down under the bridge. He knew where they waited for the train. So we went down there. Sure enough, there they were. There was my stereo. So I got the stereo back, and the cop said, do you want to press charges? I said, no, because I felt sorry for him, you know. I said, no, I don't want to press charges. Big mistake. Because that night they rode the train to the next town, broke into a paper bag factory, and started a fire because it was about 30 degrees outside, and burned the factory to the ground. And I'm pretty sure it was the same guys from the descriptions they gave. I should have just pressed charges. And they'd have had a nice warm place to stay for a few days, you know. And maybe even for, probably wouldn't have been too long, because the whole stereo back then you could buy one for, I think it was 90 bucks or something, all right? And so the thief is never going to just bring the stuff back. And when the Lord comes, if we're in the things we ought not to be, then all of the rewards that we had earned from before, they're gone like a thief taking them away. 
And there's no getting them back. So we need to be looking for the Lord to come. We are not of the darkness. We the saved are not in darkness. We are the children of light and children of the day. Verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Okay, so now leading up to that, let's read verse 6 and 7. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. What he's doing here is he's saying, hey, when the thief came, you were totally oblivious. You were asleep. You're unaware of what's going on. And they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, those are, that's those that are totally out of control. My dad, he's in heaven now, but when I was younger, he was a weekend drunk. Right? He earned the right, working five days a week, he earned the right to get drunk on Friday night, he earned the right to get drunk on Saturday night, and Sunday was hangover day. I remember that from when I was young. Every Sunday was hangover day, Friday night, Saturday night, he stayed away from dad. Why? Because he was out of control. During the week when he was sober, he would help you. He would literally give you the shirt off his back. If you needed something and dad knew about it, he'd help you do it. He'd, he'd make sure that, that you, whatever you needed, if you needed it, not that you wanted it, but if you needed it, he, would, he was the guy that would always help anybody. But when he was drunk, you'd be talking to him and bam, he'd punch you in the face. What did I say? Well, you know. No, I don't even know what I said. My mom got slapped many times because she'd stay at punch because she'd step in between dad and us kids. So we just learned that when he's drunk, stay away from him. Why? You had no idea what he was going to do. None. You didn't know if he was going to throw something, break something, or break you. He, he got in a fight in the bar one night, and he was punching this guy in the face, and, and he had to keep doing this because he couldn't see the guy. And he, man, he, wet, and he didn't realize until later the guy cut him there, and when he was wiping off his face with blood running down over his eyes. He didn't even know it. He had a tattoo from the Second World War that had a big scar right through it where the guy cut him with a knife. About three inches long. He had no idea. Read back in the Proverbs. The drunk have the wounds and hurts that they don't even know where they came from. They had no idea where they came from. And yet I will seek it again. And so here he's talking about those that, that are asleep, sleep in the night. He's talking about those that are oblivious to the second coming. They're, they're just unaware that it's, hey, it could happen any second. Now, well, maybe when I wake up, I'll think about it. Well, the problem is they don't wake up. They just live that way. They just keep going on. Yeah. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. The ones that are totally out of control. They may know about the Lord, but they don't care. You know, someone that's drunk, they don't care if you're their best friend. They don't care who you are. You say the wrong thing, bam. You got it before you even know what you said, if you even remember what you said. And so that's the, what he's using here. He's saying, hey, those that are not looking for the second coming, some of them are just totally unaware. And they're just, hey, they're asleep. They're oblivious to the fact the Lord could come back any second. So don't worry about what you did yesterday. We're sleeping here right now. Or you're totally out of control. That's those that know, but they don't care anymore. They that sleep, sleep in the night, verse 7. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. That means self-controlled. That's what the root word means. Here he's using the metaphor of drunkenness and sleep and that. But the word itself literally means self-control. We're not to be out of control like a drunk. We're to be self-controlled. Well, wait a minute. If I have no control over the Lord's coming back, then what's the self-control for? Self-control. I'm supposed to watch the way I'm living. I'm supposed to do the things God says to do. You're supposed to do the things God says to do. And not do the things he says to not do. Don't be oblivious to them and unaware, but then don't be so hard-headed that, that we just decide, hey, I'm going to do it, and I don't care. Clear as bubble gum. The one cartoon I remember was a little kid in the cartoon that was in clear as bubble gum. He says, if I do, I did a whipping. Yeah. I do that. Yeah. See, he knew he was going to get spanked, but he thought the pleasure of what he was going to do would outweigh the pain of the consequences. That's not going to be here. 
It's going to be like destruction. Destruction of all the good works that maybe we had done in the past. Because you read in the Old Testament. And it tells us that God deals with us today with what we're doing today. The past is past. It's forgiven in Christ. Hey, the sin I do today is forgiven in Christ as far as my salvation. But when he deals with me and when he deals with you as a father, if we do things that are out of control or we're just ignoring daddy, yeah, okay, then he'll apply the Board of Education to the seat of understanding. So that self-control, we then are not of the night, we're children of the day, we're to be sober, self-controlled. That means I'm to control myself. Oh, well, wait a minute. How can I do that? I know, Terry. You know yourself. And you know as well as I do that there's moments in all of our lives when we're out of control. If you read over in the Gospels, Jesus said the cares of this world and riches and things of this world, they, we just get sidetracked. And it might only be for a moment, but it only takes a moment to do a sin. In a moment of weakness, we'll do something that we wish we could take back. It's like everything we say. There's things that we say, we wish we could go <laughs> and suck them back in. But once they're out there, they're there. And there's no going back. Nope. The hurt has already been done. We can apologize. I sent a text to somebody last night to apologize for something. It was not an overt thing, but I ignored someone that I shouldn't have ignored for very good reasons, but I still felt bad about it. I was ordered to do something, all right? But I felt bad about it, so I sent a text and said, hey, I want to apologize. I had no choice in the matter, but still I feel bad about it. Have you ever done or said things like that? Things that you wish you could undo? Amen. Some sins we can undo. Uh, smoking them cigars, swallowing all that tobacco, and sucking down all that hooch, there was no turning back. It was 50 years later. I had cancer of the colon. And it was either from smoking the cigars and you're swallowing that tobacco, you're swallowing that nicotine, you get more cancer from oral tobacco than you do from cigarettes. It's just that lung cancer is harder to treat, you're more likely to die. But my colon cancer was either from the booze or from smoking those cigars and swallowing that stuff all the time. There was no turning back. I've said this a hundred times. If I'd known I was going to live this long, I'd have taken a lot better care of myself when I was younger. Because I suffer the consequences now of the misuse that I made of this body that belongs to Christ. Oh, I was lost at the time. That's no excuse. Might be a reason. But God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He kept me alive. I don't know how he kept me alive. I had people after me with a knife. I had people after me with a gun because of the way I was living. There are consequences for what we do. Oh, yeah. And even now when we're saved, there are consequences for what we do. That's right. We won't go to hell because Christ already paid our debt for us. But we still have to suffer the consequences for what we do to this body here and the consequences later of being out of the will of God. And for that sin, the Old Testament says, hey, yesterday's righteousness cannot make up for today's unrighteousness. But today's righteousness can make up for yesterday's unrighteousness. In other words, what we're doing today, when he comes back, what we're doing right then is what he's going to deal with us. And that's the way he's going to deal with us. Are we doing the things he wants us to do and not doing the things he says not to do? It's up to us. It's self-control. But wait a minute. Sometimes I get out of control. Well, you know what? He addressed that too. All right? In uh, verse 8, let us who are of the day be sober as self-control. How do we do that? Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. See? Putting on the breastplate. Right. Well, that sounds kind of familiar. Well, yes it does because um, in Ephesians 6.14 Ephesians 6.14 We're not in this battle alone nope. unless we want to be. Well, we can fight this battle alone if we want to. Ephesians 6.14. Talking about the armor of God. But over in 1 Thessalonians, it's called the breastplate of faith and love. Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to go to verse 14. 
10, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. Where does our righteousness come from? The Lord God. It doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from the flesh. It's only by the power of God working through the Holy Spirit in our lives and through us to other people. Doc Bess used to say, let the Holy Spirit go on through you because some of them will keep sticking on the sides. When you bless other people, that's the Holy Spirit flowing through you. But that, hey, I feel like I'm pleasing God today. That's some of the Holy Spirit sticking on the side. And so it's only through Christ that we have our righteousness. Back over in Ephesians 5, 8, the breastplate of faith and and love. It's only by faith in Christ that we can even live the way that we should. Faith and love. It's only by God's love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we can only live our life, and Jesus said, I came to give them life, and that more abundantly. And so it's only by the faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit working through our channel of faith that we can live right. And it's only because of God's love that we even have access to God to have the power to live right. The Bible, in in Romans, God through Paul told us that when we were lost, we were slaves to sin. We were slaves to sin. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Didn't do that. Didn't do that. I didn't do that. that. God said, yeah, but you sure did that a lot. A sin that does so easily beset us. That same sin is still there now that we're saved. Mm -hmm. That same sin can still easily beset us. If in a moment of weakness, we quit letting God live through us, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, it's only God living through us that can keep us straight. And any time we think we can do it on our own, God's going to say, okay, if that's what you want. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in this fallen universe, in this body that doesn't know about the uh, law of God and can't follow it because it doesn't even know it exists because it knows nothing. It's a biological machine. It's the Terry, the soul that inside that is living inside, that knows what's right and what's wrong. And I decide what this body's going to do. You decide what your body's going to do. And so only by the power of God, by faith in Christ, and the love of God that he shows us through Christ, can we keep ourselves straight. Amen. We're, we're not going to do it on our own. Right. We can do it 99.9% of the time. Fine. Tell that woman that's in travail, uh, giving birth to a child, that she was only 99.9% pregnant. <laughs> Either are or you ain't. You either are pregnant or you're not pregnant. There's no, no kindness to it. So don't let it be a surprise. No. When the Lord comes back, it needs to be a pleasant surprise, not a surprise of pain and travail like a woman giving birth. Okay? So we're, we're to be awake, not, not asleep, not unaware that the Lord's coming back any second now. Since 1948, when, when Israel once again became a nation, there is nothing in the Bible that needs to be fulfilled before the second coming. We're just living on borrowed time. The Bible said that Israel had to be a country. From that time, 1948 forward, he had come back at any second. Mm-hmm. He, could have, he could have come back any second before that. How? He could have put Israel back in the land a thousand years ago if he chose to do so. But for some reason, he chose to do it in 1948. That's right. And from that time on now, we're on borrowed time. Let's not be unaware. Be asleep. Oh, hey, I I did all these things today, and, you know, I might be awake, but I'm sleepwalking. I'm sleepwalking. What do you mean you're sleepwalking? Well, I'm doing things I ought not to do and acting like, well, I'm asleep. I'm acting like I'm unaware. I'm oblivious to the fact the Lord could come back any second. Thank you. And what I'm doing wrong. Or surprise me while I'm doing right. It's up to me. It's up to you. Self-control. Be sober. We're children of the day. We're not children of the night. We should be aware the Lord can come back in a second. And we put on the whole, put on the breastplate of faith and love. And then, i got one more. The latter part of that, the helmet of salvation. I'm back in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of, plate 
of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Hope? Oh, do you mean just, I'm hoping? See, we're saved now, all right? All right. Present possession, it, we're saved. But the Bible tells us our salvation is not going to be revealed until in the future when the Lord comes back and we'll physically see the Savior that's already saved us and we're kept by the Holy Spirit that lives within us because it's the Spirit that quickens us. But our salvation is not going to be revealed until the Lord comes back. We've got it. It'd be like saying, uh, uh, I bought you a car and I've got it in the, in the, in the garage over here uh, and on your birthday, I'm going to give it to you. And here's the title. It's already yours. That's the Holy Spirit, by the way. It's the title of our salvation. Right. And so, here's the title. Of, it's your car, but it hasn't been revealed to you because I want it to be a surprise on your birthday. Do you think that'd be a good surprise or a bad surprise? Yeah. Good. I think it'd be good if I gave you a car, especially a red one like Fred's got. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Yeah. With that... With that purple suit and that red car, I bet people, I bet people know Fred's coming. So if I was going to give you a car in a suit like that, it'd be a good surprise. But if I had an old piece of junk that somebody had stolen, and they had ripped all the parts out of it, and they left it over down, there's a couple of places down south and west down there where there are junk cars alongside the road, back out, it'd be north of the airport out there. And, uh, and they burn them up. And I'd say, hey, I got you a car. And, and here's the title, and I'm going to give it to you on your birthday. You go, oh, <laughs> I didn't say it ran. I didn't say it was a I just said it was a car. I didn't say it was a whole car. I said it was a car. And then on your birthday, I've got this big red bow on the door of the garage, and, and, you, you, and you give you scissors, and you cut the ribbon, and you open it, open it, and there's a piece of junk there. It's not even junk anymore. It's a burned out hulk. Is that what we want when the Lord comes back? No. I don't. I don't know about you, but I want to be caught doing something good. Amen. See, that's one of the problems we make with our children. We're quick to come down on them when they do something bad, but how quick are we to reward them when they do something good? Because that's the biblical principle. There should be negative consequences for negative actions. But the other side of that coin is there should always be positive consequences for positive actions. He's our Heavenly Father. So when he comes back, is it going to be a... Red car and purple suit, man. Hey, all right. I love it, man. Not only that, it paid for it. Dr. Vest, one of my teachers in college, when he was 18, a church asked him to pastor that church, and he did, and he was there for, oh, six months or eight months or something, and the men of the church got together and decided, Pastor, you need a new car. So they went out and got a new car and handed him the keys, the title, and the payment book. <laughs> All they got, did was got the money together to make the, the, the down payment. No, he didn't. His, he almost went totally belly up bankrupt. He, he didn't have enough money to go bankrupt. Because that church was so small that his wages, when he first took that church, his wages were the men of the church got together and the farmer said, hey, I've got my farm. I'm going to give you six gallons of milk a week. Another guy raised chickens and ducks and, you know, poultry. He said, I'll bring you a couple of chickens a week. And uh, another one says, hey, I raised beef. Uh, I'll bring you a few pounds of meat each week to take care of you and your family. That was his wages. The money he got, I know, because there, I pastored a church one time. I got, uh, I was supposed to get 150 a month. And I never got more than about 50 or 75 a month most of the time. But the men got together and decided they needed a raise. So they said, Pastor, you're going to get paid 150 bucks a week. I got paid one time 50 bucks and never got paid again. You can't give money that's not there. That's why when you pastor a church, the idea is, yeah, you're going to get paid if the money's there. You, you, if it's not there, it's not there. I mean, come on, they're not God. They can't bring down manna from heaven, have it turned into gold coins on the earth. And so, I want to be caught doing something good. Amen. And I want to be 
rewarded for it because isn't there rewards when we obey God? Do it says, crown of righteousness, the soul winner's crown, uh, the crowns that we can earn, the rewards that we're going to get. Uh, we will be priests and kings. We'll rule and reign with him. We can either rule and reign and maybe be the, uh, uh, the governor over Utah or you might be the guy that's running the local sewer crew. You'll be the boss. But you'll be down in, the, in, the, in, down in the pipes and stuff down there working with the sewer group. It all depends on what we do here. Our rewards there depend totally on what we do here. Do we want to get caught doing good? Do we want, want to get caught doing something sneaky? Every head bowed every head closed. We are children of the day. I'm going to read a couple more verses during the invitation. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. That means the pastor and the teachers, the ones that admonish, the ones that teach. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that none re render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Save the lost. We're never to render evil for evil. But overcome evil with good. How do we treat one another? The pastor, the teachers, those that admonish you, Esteem them in love for their work's sake. They're, they're doing the Lord's work. Our Sunday school teachers are doing the Lord's work. Those that are back in junior church are doing the Lord's work. We're to esteem them highly. Say, hey, appreciate it. Thank you for teaching that class. We're doing junior church, adult Sunday school, children's Sunday school. The associate pastor that talks with people, prays with them, loves them. But not only this pastor and the staff, be at peace among yourselves. Lord comes back, finds us bickering and fighting. It's not going to be a good thing. But he comes back and finds that we are at peace. Among ourselves, all of us, all men. And doing good, not only to each other, to, to all the members of the church, but even to the lost. If you're, you're either a child of the day or you're a child of the night. If you're not saved, then you're a child of the night. You need to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Then you'll become a child of the day. It'll be your choice whether to act like it or not, but you will be a child of the day. You'll be saved. It's easy. The Bible says you just... Humble your heart before God. Talk to Him. That's all praying is. Say, God, I know I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. But I don't want to die and go to hell. I accept your only begotten Son, Jesus, as my own personal Savior. I believe in my heart that He shed His blood and died for me personally on Calvary. I believe in my heart He was buried in the tomb, in the grave, for me personally. And I believe in my heart. He was raised from the dead again the third day to show me how you will raise me personally and perfect in the resurrection. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for taking me from the night and the darkness and becoming a child of the light, a child of the day. Thank you. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you prayed that before, it was a done deal. God will spank us, but he'll never kick us out of his hand. But if you accepted Christ as your personal Savior today, just raise your hand and give God a way of offering for saving you today. Anyone like that? Right, how about the rest of you? Do we honor those that do the teaching, the Sunday school teacher, the pastor? Yes. Yeah. I learned from everybody. I learned from you. Some what to do, some what not to do, but I still learn from everybody. And I love you.
for it. I respect you for it. Do we show that to the staff? Is it just as important? Are we at peace with one another? Yeah, we're to warn them that are unruly. We're, we're, we're to help lift them up. But not do evil to them. And to the lost. We're to, we're to give them Christ. But we're not to do evil to them. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. What's God going to catch us doing when Christ comes back? Pleasant surprise. Wonderful new car, new suit. Or a piece of junk. It's up to us. It's the self control in the power of God. But we got to decide to do it or not do it. Ask God if he's pleased with you. Pleased with you today. Because I ask him that every day. All right, amen. amen. Stand with us, please. Don't forget the birthday party tonight after the evening service. And uh, Brother Joel, would you dismiss us in prayer? Then we'll have the dismissal song, and then we'll all I'll meet you out the hall that day. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this message that you brought to us, Lord. Lord, I pray that we'd all just examine our hearts, our lives, that we would just be aware of what we are doing for you and the things that we need to do for you, Lord. Watch over us, I pray, that you keep us safe as we leave this building. Father, I pray you just give us the opportunity to come back this evening and worship you again. We thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's turn to page number 342, and let's be dismissed with verse number 3, New York